Um, I want to talk about pretending. That is something that I know a little bit about. <laughs> I, I pretended to be a certain person and <laughs> to feel a certain way for almost 10 years, and now I am supposedly not pretending every night. <laughs> Though occasionally I am pretending to know what I am doing out here. <laughs> you know, right? You ever get that feeling, just kind of pretending how to do this job? Yeah. Don't really know what we're doing yeah, sometimes. Yeah, we, we have no but idea. You put a smile, <laughs> you put a smile on your face, and you do your best, right? There you go. It's like we're it's we're, dis we're discovering the show as we go along, and it's like learning to play a new instrument in public. But what <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but whether or not we hit the right notes on any given night, I think that the least that we can do is not pretend to always know what to do or say. And in the face of the killings in Oregon yesterday, I honestly don't know what to do or say, other than that our hearts are broken for the people struck by this senseless tragedy. And I don't know how to start a show like this, which is often about whatever happened in the last 24 hours. I can't pretend that it didn't happen. I also can't pretend to know what to do to prevent what happened yesterday all the times it has happened before. But I think pretending is part of the problem. These things happen over and over again, and we are naturally horrified and shocked when we hear about them. But then we change nothing, and we pretend that it won't happen again. Some say the answer is stricter gun laws. Others say the answer is mental health care, that we need better treatment or just keep the guns out of the hands of the insane. Maybe it's both. I honestly don't know. But I do know that one of the definitions of insanity is changing nothing and then pretending that something will change. Speaking of honest insanity... <laughs> speaking... Speaking of honest insanity, Donald Trump. <laughs> and I do... I'm clear, I want to be clear about this. I do think he is honest in his own way. He is honestly an egomaniacal billionaire. <laughs> and this week in New Hampshire, Trump demonstrated that he will not tolerate dishonesty from his opponents like Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. And they ask Bush, what do you think of Rubio? Rubio comes out and he's talking about Bush and, you know. What do you think of Rubio? He's my dear friend. He's so wonderful. I love him so much. <laughs> then they asked Rubio, who's running against Bush? And he, you know, probably shouldn't be from a loyalty standpoint. So they ask Rubio, what do you think of Bush? Oh, he's my dear friend. Wonderful, just one. They hate each other. <laughs> they hate. Trust me, I know. <laughs> they hate so much. They hate more than anybody in this room hates their neighbor. <laughs> Any. But it's political bull <laughs> Do you understand? It's true. It's true. It is true. <laughs> and that's why people love this guy. Because, because he understands. He knows you hate your neighbor for building that giant tower that blocks your view. Mr. Trump, bring the sun back. <laughs> Donald is honest enough to admit what we all know. The candidates cannot stand each other. I mean, just look at the last Republican debate. Oh, Don't get it. in my face. Do not <laughs> break up my family! You <laughs> f***ing <laughs> You mother <laughs> Wow. Wow. Jake Tapper really lost control of that one. <laughs> And so, right now, Mr. Trump, to answer your call for political honesty, I just want to say, you're not going to be president, all right? <laughs> it's been fun. It's been great. I love you. But, but, but come on, come on, buddy. All, let's say, cow poo poo aside, <laughs> there is zero chance we'll be seeing you being sworn in on the Capitol steps with your hand on a giant golden Bible. And speaking of political bullshit, Congress, <laughs> right now, 
Right now, the big story from Capitol Hill is about House Majority Leader and California's number one above ground pool salesman, Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> He's a rising star who was such a player that when Kevin Spacey was preparing to play Frank Underwood on House of Cards, he shadowed McCarthy on the Hill. <laughs> Spacey was supposed to follow him for an entire week, but he ended up binge watching McCarthy on a Sunday. <laughs> when somebody started asking, Last week, who's going to replace John Boehner as Speaker of the House? McCarthy said, why not me? Then immediately told us why not. What you're going to see is a conservative speaker that takes a conservative Congress that puts a strategy to fight and win. And let me give you one example. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Well, that's refreshing. <laughs> at least he's not pretending that hurting Hillary's poll numbers wasn't at least part of the Benghazi committee's mission. And it's nice to see that level of cold political calculation somewhere other than from the Clinton campaign. <laughs> but in the aftermath of this statement, Republicans are ripping into McCarthy. Chairman of the Oversight Committee and seductive beaver mascot, Jason Chaffetz. <laughs> called McCarthy's admission absolutely inappropriate and said he should apologize. Or at the very least, McCarthy should take a tip from Frank Underwood the next time he wants to divulge a devious plot, do it in a monologue when no one is around. <laughs> and I gotta say, I agree with McCarthy's critics. It was a mistake to suggest the Benghazi investigations were all about taking down Hillary Clinton. Unfortunately, McCarthy committed the biggest sin in politics, honestly admitting something that everyone was already saying. And now that McCarthy's little white truth is out there, it can't be taken back. Suddenly, people are asking, were the 10 congressional committees, the 171 witnesses, the 40,000 pages of documents, the millions of dollars spent investigating these tragic deaths in Benghazi purely politically motivated? I'm not sure. So the only way to find out is with the Benghazi hearing hearings. <laughs> or, no, wait, maybe these investigations of what the congressman said need a name that doesn't feel so political. How about the McCarthy hearings? <laughs> that has a ring of honesty to it.